people and intersectional problems. So who am I and why do I get to talk to you? Well, as Blake said, Ashley Howard, hi. Um, I'm a scholar of racial violence, very proudly in the history and African American studies program. Right, so it's part of what I do is to think about these histories from the perspective of Black people. Almost 15 years ago, I began a seminar paper on the uprisings in the Midwest, right? Urban development, civil unrest in the 1960s. And I found that people are acting at the intersections of their identity. White working class men are working in the uprisings in a certain way. Black working class men are working in the uprisings in a certain way. Black working class women are operating in this thing. So this idea of who one is and where one is, is very prominently defining how they're participating. I also discovered that the uprisings were working class insurrections, right? This wasn't just civil rights, but these were also for labor and economic rights. And finally, I discovered that violence is both protest and politics, right? And so the ways that we should look at violence as a mechanism, as a means to an end for many different people is important. So the first 10 years, let's say, right? Because you know these projects take forever. Um, the first 10 years that I did this project, everybody just kind of smiled and nodded a little skeptically, right? They're polite because it's the Midwest. Like, okay, so you're really telling me that a whole bunch of people going out, burning things, breaking glass, are actually political actors? Yes. And then the other thing that they didn't believe is that these events happen in places like Waterloo or Peoria, Illinois, or Benton Harbor, Michigan. Right? These types of urban disturbances or something in places like Newark or Detroit or Watts, not the communities that they were familiar with. But all of that changed in 2014. If Ferguson was the gentle nudge to wake America up, the widespread protests originating out of Minneapolis after George Floyd's death was the blaring alarm. And still, the nation clung to narratives of triumphant racial progress and Midwestern meritocracy like a security blanket. But this frame is not a new one. So, March 1968, Omaha's newspapers, reporters, right? They're zigzagging around the city from the smashed windows and charred buildings in North Omaha to the manicured laws, excuse me, lawns and racial covenants that dominated West Omaha. They're hounding residents for their perspective on the city's racial issues. Now, two weeks prior, presidential candidate George Wallace's quote, goon squad, along with Plains Code police officers had forced Omaha's teenage picketers to run a gauntlet, feeding them with steel chairs and batons as they left the venue where the battle took place. This chaos and violence tumbled out into the civic, from the Civic Auditorium towards the north side, which was predominantly Black uh, neighborhood. And on North 24th Street, outraged protesters broke plate glass windows, damaged cars, and set fire to storefronts. But Omaha certainly was not the only city reeling from a George Wallace visit. The Alabama governor, known for his escapades as his famous segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, rallying cry, and also ceremoniously standing in front of the school building to prevent the enrollment of Black students at the university's flagship uh, university, right? This guy found significant support in the Midwest. Now, while Wallace's shot at becoming president was in fact a long shot, right? He got about 13.5% of the popular vote and 46 uh, electoral college ballots. He resonated with Midwesterners, white Midwesterners. 
Now, I just want to take a pause and look at this right here, right? So this is the aforementioned rally that took place in Poland. And why I want to pause on this, right? Because the story becomes the uprising that happens after Wallace and not the violence that happened before. So first, there's great signs up there. My favorite is right dead center. Lawlessness, excuse me, lawlessness is lawlessness, right? I just think that's a great um, phrase. But then you also see these two tiers of people, the folks who are here to get Wallace on the ballot of Nebraska's American party, and then these protesters, right? And right in the middle, you see this man with the black power sweatshirt on. That's Father Jack McCaskill, right? He is the chaperone of the student protesters who were there that day. I did an oral history interview with uh, Father McCaskill, and he said that when they got there, right, all of the adults and the older protesters were encouraged and kind of shepherded up to the upper balcony, whereas the younger protesters were moved to the front, right in front of Wallace's stage. Also, in later years, his campaign manager said that he would intentionally book smaller than needed venues to really pack them in there, right? Because he knew these were contested spaces and that something would pop up and that the media would play it, that these folks are the rabble rousers, the wrongdoers, the anti-Americans, and these folks have the true birthright to the Midwest and elsewhere. And by ushering these students to the front, they're starting to get arrested, right? Many of them are your age. They're in Baldwin, Baldwin, Baldwin. Right, and so they are throwing pieces of their sign up on board. They are, you know, catcalling Wallace. And so in his presentation, he gets up there and says, it's people like you. And pointing down to the audience, which touches off the melee, right? You people are our problem. And so by pausing and thinking of the broader context, which were actually antecedents, of the violence we become focused on, we begin to see a different picture. Wallace's startling popularity capitalized, right, in the Midwest, capitalized on the racial, economic, and gendered anxieties of the era and the region. Audiences enthusiastically embraced Wallace's rhetoric as when a packed room of Milwaukee's so-called working class urban ethic, ethnics, serenaded him in a bilingual version, English and Polish, of Dixie. None of these people lived south of the Mason-Dixon line, right? But that was a key, a dog whistle, so to speak, of how they saw themselves and how they were aligning. And while not outright leaning on racial epithets, Wallace captured white Midwesterners unease by articulating local whites' economic worries, as well as saying that these people, right, people like you are the problem, and promising a return of the communities that they feared no longer represented them or their values. Wallace magnified a sentiment so deep that it ultimately embodied an entire region's verification, specifically that the Midwest, understood inherently as white, was built upon self-reliance and hard work, and that Black challenges to inequality were meritless. The Midwest was a land of opportunity, so the logic. African Americans were just simply unwilling to work. As one white West Omaha housewife quipped, well, why don't they just do what every other minority did? Why don't they just pull themselves up at their bootstraps? And when the reporter quoted this line back to a black laborer who resided in North Omaha, the man retorted, aghast. They tell me to pick myself up by my bootstraps. By hell, they've taken away my boots. So at the center of this exchange 
lies what I term the Midwestern myth. And so I'm operating on this idea of a myth as something that justifies or explains the phenomenon. Now, this Midwestern myth weaves together several contradictory yarns in service of naturalizing unequal regional conditions and obscuring the actions of those who set it in motion. Number one, hard work is rewarded with prosperity and security, right? The American dream. Number two, the region is a white space. As such, there can be no racism or racial problem. And number three, this is the contradictory part. If any racial inequities do exist, they are the fault of the affected people because they have not grabbed regional opportunity by the bootstraps. So this term Middle West first became kind of in the lexicon in 1901 with Frederick Jackson Turner using it to describe this kind of great expanse of land between the East Coast and what was now the New West, right? The mountain region and the Pacific Northwest. And he is using this guy. Y'all probably seen it, well, maybe not. Uh, right, this is when you talk about the Midwest it's messy. Don't go to a Midwestern conference because you'll have lots of fights about it. Um, but this is a safe place to start, right? These 12 nations, um, if we think about the Mississippi here, this is the East North Central region, and this is the West North Central region, right? So it's this idea that it's this place in the middle. However, the recent revival of Midwestern studies has shifted scholarly inquiry away from the where the region is to the what the region is, right? What is it, its essential character? And a friend of mine made this meme and it's so perfect. And I'm delighted I get to share this with you. Oh, I had a meme. Um, this meme. <laughs> there we go, right? Mm -hmm. Where is the Midwest? No, 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 no. It's literally the Midwest. But we all know Drake himself. Yes. <laughs> so I argue that the violence, removal, and racialized exclusion that established the region's foundational framework as it's known today is the who is the Midwest. From Native American genocide to restrictive Black laws, to the creation and maintenance of sundown towns, white Midwesterners employed racial violence in all of its forms to build, make, and sustain the region. Violence in the Midwest is hardly peripheral. <clears throat> like its geographic situation, it is central to the region's mythology, history, and self-identity. Yet through the sin of omission, the Midwestern myth is perfect, excuse me, perpetuated in service of regional meritocracy and a national redemptive narrative, right? We used to have issues, but now we're great. So this top one, right? 1998, New York Times book review editors write, the Middle West is like a great backyard where America keeps the black of its innocence. Another scholar wrote, Midwesterners are apparently happy to identify with the United States as a whole. Their local pride is all about exemplifying the best of America. The Midwest is the heartland, the nation writ small, the great middles. Pause, lacking extremes, lacking diversity. And in the early 2000s, a group of scholars at Ohio State University published an encyclopedia of the Midwest. And in the opening lines, they wrote, in the American imagination, this is a place of hardworking people, thrifty, devoted to family values, strong in character, middle of the road, sedate, cautious. This is how the Midwest has come to be known. 
However, such fiction exasperates the marginalization and mistreatment of those on society's fringes through historical erasure, which I argue is another form of National stakeholders imagine and promote the Midwest as a place of safety, stability, and homogeneity. In so doing, people reimagine the very parameters of the Midwest, carefully excising urban areas like Detroit, Chicago, and St. Louis, erasing populations of color, and shifting regional boundaries to include only areas what Sarah Palin once referred to as the real America. It's not coincidence that politicians, journalists, and everyday white citizens fashion the Midwest as a symbolic heartland in the 1950s and 1960s, an era wrought with great uncertainty, angst, and progressive social change. To speak it plainly, people were freaked out. So they're creating this idea, this nostalgic idea. Frozen in the past, albeit one dissociated from any reality, the imagined Midwest became great. A museum, right? This is what the Midwest came to mean. Not the Magnificent Mile, not Idlewild in Michigan, not Nicodemus in Kansas. Yes. To be a Black Midwesterner is to grapple with this tension, to be invisible yet hyper visible, to be read as always in a place but never as of. And I want to take a moment, right, a teaching moment, to again think about these images and toggle between them, right? So I have a moment here, just look at the composition, how they're arranged, what they're showing. Back. From the family composition to their forward facing, right? Forward looking gaze, to the animals and well and dugout house. These are essentially the very same image. But when we talk about these people, it's always in a racialized context, never in a regionalized context. We must reconcile, redefine, and reinterpret the multiple <laughs> ways of being the Western by specifically putting this regional identity in conversation with a multitude of racial, class, and gender identities. The foundational step to this radical change is naming the thing that animates the system. Why? Under a lofty national agenda, violence opens the frontier the murder and displacement of indigenous nations who lived on what became the Midwest. Violence maintains systems of racial inferiority, restricting employment, housing, and civic opportunity as these areas were settled. Violence suppressed labor disputes and terrorized those on gender and sexual margins, or excuse me, on gender and sexual margins to maintain patriarchal control. Violence undergirds the most central milestone of the American triumphalist narrative. And I want to pause here again. These people are just as guilty as some of that violence. Okay? If we think about the Buffalo soldiers, they are clearing the land through the murder of indigenous people. This land that these homesteaders are sitting on was once settled by other communities. Right? So we always need to keep this in mind and go beyond this black white binary that we kind of lean into whenever we do bring other people of color into Midwestern narratives. And yet, 
our nation forgets violence on the present. It's extraordinary frequency, it's sheer commonplaceness in our history. When those terrorized by violence employ the very tool wielded against them, shock registered throughout the nation. Thus, in our regional and national histories, some forms of violence are deemed productive, right? If they advance these agreed upon agendas. But most forms of violence, especially when they're used to disrupt the status quo, are interpreted as deviant, unhinged, and anti-American. But even if one discounts this dominant interpretation, our operating definition of violence are woefully inadequate. I'm very much influenced by the work of social scientist and peace studies creator, Johan Gallup. And what he argues is that there are three broad and interlocking categories of violence. And because they're interlocking, they are all equal players and they're all dependent on one another, right? It's triangle. You need each side or each corner in order for the shape to exist. So this first one is direct violence. This is the one that we're all most familiar with. This is one person hurting another person's body. It leaves bruises and cuts and dead bodies. The second, I think in the past few years, it has become a more mainstream idea. And this is of structural or institutional violence. And this is this idea that there are systems and structures, structures which present, prevent equal opportunity. And of course, we've been seeing this in recent years, right? With broader mainstream recognition of this type of violence, there has been a uh, regression and a, um, a pushback, limiting on how we talk about these things and whether or not we can learn them. And the final one, I argue, is the most important and it's the most hidden, right? So you see in this graph, there's this line between visible and invisible violence. It's very easy to see the damage done by direct or visible violence. It's much more difficult and frankly insidious to see the violence done by structural culture. So Galton says that this most hidden form of violence, and I'm quoting him directly here, it is the thing that makes direct and structural violence look or even feel right, or at least not wrong. And so I'd like to lay out this theoretical framework on the ground. Direct violence is Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes. Institutional violence is a coroner certifying his autopsy, and I'm quoting again from it, revealed no physical findings that support a diagnosis of traumatic asphyxiation or strangulation. This is institutional violence, an official document co-signing murder. And finally, cultural violence is the multiple media outlets, social media, news media, et cetera, touting Floyd's ideas, right? His little sins as a way to justify murder, right? It's not wrong because he used a counterfeit bill. It's not wrong because he may have used illicit substance, right? It's justifying that if you're using a dollar that you don't know is fake, or if you use drugs, you deserve to die. So this next slide displays this intention because I want to wipe away these preconceived notions that were stuck, right? In order to begin to imagine these possibilities. The 21st century Midwest is a racial paradox. Metropolitan areas like Des Moines, Iowa, Madison, Wisconsin, 
Minneapolis, Minnesota, regularly rank high on the best places to live list, while being among the lowest on markers of economic and social parity for Black residents. Six of the nation's eight most segregated cities are in the Midwest, a growing trend since 1890. And as documented in my colleague Colin Gordon's 2019 Race in the Heartland report, of the 11 states with the largest gap in Black white unemployment, 10 are in the Midwest. So if you're paying attention, 10 out of the 12 states in the Midwest have the largest gaps of Black white unemployment in the nation. Each of the 12 Midwestern states in prison is Black resident at a rate of five times more than its white residents and Black students living and learning in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio, Nebraska, Illinois, and Kansas are also at five times greater risk for suspension. Now, in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, journalists grappled with these contradictions. And when they centered the perspectives of Midwesterners of color, a clear explanation emerged. Robert Lilligren, the first Indigenous council member, offered this, quoting him directly. Minneapolis has ridden this reputation of being progressive. That's the vibe. Do something superficial and feel like you did something big. Create a civil rights commission. Create a civilian review board for the police, but don't give authority to change the policy and to change the system, end quote. And as Somali immigrant Leila Ali said, captured so beautifully and succinctly, the Midwestern ethos is racism smiled. So linking back to this regional framework that I opened with, by falsely framing the Midwest as an exclusively white place without race problems, there is no issue to be managed. And this exemplifies the Midwestern myth, justifying the disparity between black and white life. And I think I've seen this most often around those prison and suspension statistics, right? This idea that black people are just inherently more criminal or that black children are inherently more troublesome. Right? That is that justified myth, that cultural violence to make it seem not so wrong or perhaps even right. And when there's no problem and there's no issue and the people are the cause of their own suffering, we don't have to fix the problem. So this is again from the Race in the Heartland report. This is showing the budget of civil rights commissions in these 10, which the Dakotas don't keep. Um, itemized budgets, civil rights commission, right? And remember, this is not just black people. This is women. This is gay and trans people. These are people with disabilities, right? They all fall under the umbrella of civil rights. So between 2008 and 2009 budgets and 2018 and 2019 budgets, not a single state had an increase in those budgets. In fact, they all had substantial decrease. And I can't help but wonder, where does this money go? Does it go to fund more school resource officers, right, campus police? Or does it go to fund children's behavioral therapists or mental health resources? And also, what might, in the case of Minnesota, $3 million made a difference in the next year when its police station burned to the ground. Right? What might this budget have done in that moment to prevent what happened a year later? The regional erasure of people of color and their authentic experiences is a form of cultural <coughs> violence which again, it's just one side of that triad, which then empowers direct 
and structural violence, rendering Black people once again in the Midwest, the not of it. But as a society, it seems that most people only ever think about violence when rocks fly through windows. Devastating figures on Black maternal mortality, non potable drinking water in Flint, the fact that meat packers died at rates three times higher than any other American during the COVID pandemic speaks to the problem that those three examples don't even come across people's mental radars as a form of preventable harm or violence. Right? Nobody should die a preventable death in childhood. Everybody should be able to have drinkable water. We have that choice. And so what we see here is what the Kerner Commission foretold in 1968. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Kerner Commission, this was a presidential commission formed by Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1967 to figure out what the heck happened in the summer of 1967, otherwise known as the long hot summer, when over 160 different American cities burned and had civil unrest. And so the Kerner Commission worked, they did interviews in 26 case study cities, talking to average people. They compiled this giant book, comes out in March, a month to the day before King was assassinated. And the opening tagline of their executive summary read this Our nation is moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. This prediction has proven true in the new millennium. Moreover, the Midwest is the Kerner Commission two nation region. Excellent schools, stable employment, and lush parks, obscure, underfunded classrooms, winding width lines, and food desert. The 2020 summer protests against police brutality captivated the world and alarmed more than a few, convinced that they were witnessing Black discontent in a region previously unmarked by it. The Black Midwest protest is only shocking if you haven't been paying attention. In the 19th century, Black Ohioans organized the first colored convention to protest the racial violence and black laws that were passed in their state. Dred Scott's famous appeal for freedom arose from his time living in Illinois and Minnesota and was filed in Missouri. African-Americans armed themselves in self-defense against racist mobs in East St. Louis in 1917 in Chicago in 1919, and again in Omaha that same year. The 1954 landmark case, Brown versus the Board of Education, took place in Topeka, Kansas. The first national Black political conference was held in 1972 in Gary, Indiana. And this is to say nothing of Black culture. Toni Morrison, Langston Hughes, Richard Pryor, Motown, Prince, adopted by mainstream America, but birthed in the Black Midwest. And yet, the Midwestern character of these prominent watersheds, integral to telling the American story, is still omitted from it. The erasure of the region's racial complexity, historically and now, not accidental. Regional parameters are fluid by design, allowing us to lump and categorize certain behaviors in search of larger truth. If the South, if the South with its de jure segregation and racial terror, is this nation racist underbelly? 
the rest of the country is off the hook. In contrast, the Midwest can exist in our collective imaginary as national proxy, aligning with the triumphalist and non-racist narrative so many of us wish and need to believe about our country. In this interpretation, the Midwest is a place without much in the way of Black history, Black presence, and thus without a history of anti-Black past or present. When politicians in turn comment fondly about Midwestern values, they're invoking a heartland of white purity, meritocracy, and family values. To the extent that the Midwest is majority white, it is because the region's very creation is predicated on settler colonialism, marginalization, exclusion, and violence. But it is not only white. And to consider that fact, and to consider the decades of sustained Black Midwestern protest and life beyond these stories of American redemption, means that we must all face an uncomfortable truth. Black Midwestern erasure is central to the maintenance of American racial discourse. The experiences, the very existence of Black people and other people of color in the Midwest challenges the fundamental nature of how white supremacy operates in this country. If we buy the myth that the Midwest is an exclusively white place without race problems, there's no issue to be managed. And protests in Minneapolis and protests in Ferguson and protests in Iowa City seem anomalous. They're not. In his 1967 essay, Where Do We Go From Here? He wrote that freedom is not won by a passive acceptance of suffering. Freedom is won by a struggle against suffering. And this is a theme that King spoke on for nearly a decade before he wrote this collection of essays. In fact, he said something very similar on this very campus. Even a superficial look at history reveals that no social advance rolls in on the wheel of inevitability. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertion and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. Okay? This is what King said at the IMU in 1959. Yet today, King's radical is lost at best and buried at worst. As historian Jean Theo Harris writes of both Rosa Parks and him, quote her directly, these two freedom fighters have been turned into Thanksgiving parade balloons, floating above us, larger than life, unthreatened, happy patriots, asking little of as they bob along, proud of our As evidenced by the quote on this screen, King is indeed asking a lot of us. This meditation mediated the interlocking tension between region and violence, expanding our framework. And true to the legacy of the man we seek to honor today, we must now also expand our action. And true to my 1980s childhood, I also ask you to start with the man or woman or person in the mirror. For those of you who don't get that, that's a Michael Jackson man. <laughs> I keep forgetting my audience stays the same age as I should. Right. So let's start with ourselves by meditating on the following question. So go ahead, take out a piece of paper. Question number one. Oh, and I should say, I look forward to having, continuing this discussion in Q&A. Question number one. 
How can I mitigate harm and prevent direct violence in our community? So how do I prevent and deal with the aftermath of direct violence? Number two, where is the intention, excuse me, the institutional violence I tacitly support? So where is institutional violence in my life? And finally, what historical erasures will I bring to life? What stories do you know? What stories don't you know? And how will you find them? In closing, I often have my students read Miriam Kaba's powerful collect collection, Hope is a Discipline. In fact, many of those, those students are in this space today. And in this, she writes, hope is a discipline and we have to practice it every single day. The violence that animates this region has calcified over centuries. As such, it must be chipped away bit by bit by bit every single day. We are not bystanders here. We are the architects, the bricklayers, and the framers of King's beloved community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all, and thank you again. Um, I would like to open it up to questions. We all knew it was coming, so <laughs> let's bring it on, guys, and start with all of you guys out there. Yes. So um, you mentioned that this um, lifelong African endeavor has stemmed from some of the things you wrote, and um, I've had the opportunity last year to write some of my favorite poems on the topic of violence. And your poem is kind of based on curious. Uh, I know what tools I used to look into this. Um, and as you know, we continue to look into the, the race story for complete, what are some of the sources and resources you are looking for? That's a great question. And it's really dependent on the history. Um, you know, like what stories you're looking at, what regions. Uh, so there are some great ones. So for me personally, with the first book project, I did a lot of oral history interviews. Uh, the Kerner Commission, even though they published a volume of Yay Big, um, I'm going to get into the real weeds here in the history archives, but they had 262 cubic feet of archives. And I'm like, what is that? Great. <laughs> Nobody knows. So imagine this room, in essence, filled with legal filing boxes of documents, right? So that was an incredibly rich source. So if there are government documents about the issues that you're finding. Um, and again, part of the great thing about being a historian is you get to tell the story, you get to find it. So not only oral histories and government documents, but are there films about it? And this is where the American or African American studies comes in. Are there films about your question? Are there songs? Are there photographs? Are there material culture items, right? So like Father McCaslin's Black Power Structure, right? That is a text even though it's something he wore to send a message and also keep himself warm. Um, and I'm also a big, big fan of local libraries because they often have what's called vertical files. And that's just somebody like cutting things out of the newspaper and sticking in a file that nobody ever thinks about again. And <laughs> facts. And, um, and uh, also like county historical societies. And this ties into the second book project, which is on a lynch, right? It all depends what you're researching, right? Because this lynching, nobody's really thought about it. Nobody actually knows it happened in their community. And so people are just like, come on, and like, have at it, look at all these documents. Whereas with the kind of more public facing urban rebellions in larger cities, the archival record is actually pretty shabby, right? I go into police departments and say, hey, can I have all their arrest records? From the riot in 67, and they're like, oh, it's not a capital offense. We pitch it after 20 years. I know it's kind of like 
hard break. So yeah, so I think that's a really good thing. If you want to chat afterwards about specifically what you're interested in, I'm happy to you know, brainstorm some other places. Too. No problem. Yes. Fine. Oh, sorry. Oh no, it's like, fine. You're just fine. It's all good. I'm not teaching this semester, so this is going to be like <laughs> understandable. <laughs> understandable. Go ahead. Go ahead. So that is very much a, a story of a particular era, right? So Black people are coming to the Midwest when Chicago is literally just a trading place, right? And founded by a Black man, right? DeSalvo was a Black Chicago before Chicago was a place. So urban centers are key because you see lots of Black people coming to the Midwest during the Great Migration. So roughly 1914s through 1970s. And so this becomes read as the singular Black Midwestern experience. And as such, right, this is what I'm saying, we begin to cut out Chicago and not Midwesterners or Detroit from the story, even though they're directly. And what's key is those Black Chicagoans, they got family, right? And those family live in the South. They live in smaller places like Cato, Illinois, or Danville, Illinois, right? And so they're going where the jobs are, often along the railroad. And so you see these really interesting family stories that are beyond the urban areas. The urban areas are oftentimes an anchor for Black and Western communities because of jobs, because of technology, technology, and frankly, because of safety, right? If there are thousands of Black people, there are more opportunities and safety than if you are a single Black family in some place, you know, like Metropolis. Yeah. Thank you. We do have a question from the Zoom, or actually, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you could talk to us about the structure or how your studies have uh, impacted your sense of identity as a Midwesterner. Yes, every day I <laughs> say that I'm a Midwesterner. Um, and, you know, I hate the phrase like research is me search, right? And it like diminishes what we do. But I very much came to this field through my own identity as Black Midwesterner. Now, I'm a bit remiss to say this out loud, given where I work and who signs my paychecks. Um, but I was born in Nebraska. Uh, I'm a very proud Omaha. And even our joke, like when I got this job, I was like over the moon. And my folks were like, really? Uh, but yeah, so I very much see it. And I was so shocked, like when I went to college in Chicago and we read My Auntie. Anybody read that? Is it being phased out? Thank you. Uh, so it's a classic novel by Willa Cather about the sadness and destitution of living on the plains. And everybody's like, mm -hmm. it's like, it must be so hard for you. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that black people are in the middle of this, okay? And then the second point is that, like, we just don't get it because it doesn't fit into these neat categories that we have, right? So, like, what does it mean that Toni Morrison, arguably like one of the best American authors, writes so lovingly about this space and that it informed her craft? Or that like Prince was a homework for Minneapolis, right? He loved him some Twin Cities, right? And how does that create the funkiest, you know, musician of our lifetimes, right? So I'm not saying I'm on Prince level. But <laughs> I was fortunate enough to come into thinking of these ideas informed with my own love and pride of the Black Midwest. And it's been further nurtured by spaces like an organization that I'm part of called the Black Midwest Initiative. And it's very much about thinking of the ways in which Black people define this region for ourselves, absent of these tropes of Black violence. And so really thinking about the Black Midwest not as a space of contestation, but of joy and growth and family. So, thank you. I'm going to get to the Zoom question because I feel like this is a great one for everyone else to hear as well. So I appreciate that. Um, and we all do. The question is, I can imagine that doing this work and sifting through some of the horrifying stories of our history can be very emotionally draining. How do you take care of yourself during these times and what motivates you to continue with the work? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so one thing that I read that is very, very inspired by 
is Ross Gay's um, book. Uh, but he has a new one that just came out, which is why that one is the one that's in my head called Inciting Joy. But the book that he wrote, Book of Joy, Book of Delights, that's what it is. And so every day he wrote a thing, something that delighted him. And so I very much think about that. When I'm in the thick of this, I think of something that delights me, right? Like something that I'm happy to be alive of and understanding. And there's a very intimate tie between understanding anti-Black violence and Black joy, right? And this is what Gay writes about. <clears throat> if we only ever see Blackness and suffering, and those two things are mutable and all this tied, then what's the need to change it, right? If Blackness is only ever a story about death and harm, then we're off the hook. And I think the other thing is remembering that these people in, in the space of these horrible things had joy and happiness. And it didn't dawn on me until January 6th, 2021. So my gig before this, I was living in New Orleans. In New Orleans, that's the first day you can eat a king. And trust me, I'm gonna get all of my king cake eat, eating in. Surprise, surprise, hard to find a king cake in Iowa. So I began making my own. And so when I made a king cake in 2022, I'm going back to my home to see the pictures of the beautiful king cake I made year prior, and it struck me, right? Here's me posing with my beautiful confection among texts of, oh my God, they're in the Capitol. Oh my God, they're looking for pens. Oh my God, what is happening? And I recognize that I'm living history while wearing a purple, green, and gold sequin headband and eating a giant cinnamon roll. And so recognizing that the people who are living through this history also have joy and happiness. Um, and personally, I like to meditate. I do the journaling thing. I have great friends and family. Um, and I like a good snack and plaster. Love it. Love it. Okay, we have time for just about one more. Go with you. Um, I kind of had a question thinking about the trial that you had with the different types of violence. And um, do you feel that it's enough to, as far as institutionalized violence or structural violence, do you feel that it's enough to just start teaching the new history and bringing these stories to light as there's so much whitewashing of history? And I think I'm in the new generation, I'll say, I'm an undergrad and I work, work with Daria, but I was born after the Black UK and I'm. Part of this new generation, <laughs> part of this new generation is teaching you about these things, but is it enough? These stories for new generations, you have to kind of unteach older generations. It depends. I, and it's funny because I, oh, sorry, the question is Is decentering into institutional violence enough, or do we need to think of whole new ways of teaching this? Um, which is a great question. In the decade I've been doing this, I've seen a trajectory. And I was actually just talking about something right before this that it used to be that I was like able to like drop this knowledge, these knowledge bombs. Like, did you know about this lady? Did you know that? And then people came in and they knew these stories. And so then we could unpack the complexity and thinking about like what does it mean that black people are displacing indigenous nations for freedom, right? And we can get to what I think are the media questions. But I do fear with kind of the widespread attack on racialized history that we might be going back to the old way. And for me, when I teach, the other thing that is so critical is to think about ourselves in these places, right? And so it's, right, the, the person in the mirror understanding. And so, yeah, I talk about racial violence, but I have white skin, right? And so when I think about these histories, whose narrative do I need to be more mindful about inserting in my own history? And so I know for me, like ableism, and thinking of how do we insert disability and disabled Midwesterners into these stories and thinking about how this animates it. I think about the places I have privilege and thinking about how I can show up for the people, right? I have a tenure track job at a research forum institution, right? What about people who are contingent laborers? What about people who are hourly workers? How can I use that privilege to help shout out their stories and to stand in solidarity. And so in other works that Galtung does, right, this is what he gets at, that in order to have peace, 
we must equal the playing field, right? We must give everybody the opportunity to be free from potential harm, right? This preventable violence. And so that's what I think about is where can I, and that's kind of that second question um, that I asked of all y'all is like, where can I show up, right? And how can I be a part of the solution and the possibility and not just a problem? Thank you.